Was Andre Segovia the best classical guitarist ever? What does six equal D mean? And what about C3, C5, etc.? We're going to talk about those topics today and talk about how to improve on classical guitar. And we're going to start right now. So was Andre Segovia the best classical guitarist ever? That's a tricky question. I feel like however I answer this one, uh, somebody's going to come after me with a pitchfork. Uh, but, uh, you know, Andre Segovia was such a legendary figure in the classical guitar world that he tends to provoke strong emotions either positively or negatively. But let me start with the positive. Andre Segovia did an immense amount for the guitar. He brought the guitar to concert stages. He had a highly individual interpretational style. Um, he inspired a lot of other guitarists to pick up the guitar. He inspired a lot of composers to write uh, for the guitar and convinced a lot of composers to write for the guitar. He did a lot of arrangements of music for guitar. So um, Andre Segovia's contribution to the classical guitar was enormous. He was a very, very good player, but was he the best ever? Well, I suppose you could say that his technique had some flaws in some instances and uh, that there are players like John Williams and David Russell that in some ways uh, could be considered better players of the classical guitar. I will say for my personal taste, I spend more time listening to John Williams and David Russell than Segovia. I definitely listen to Segovia. I think there's a lot to learn from him. But I do uh, find that sometimes the sound and cleanness of the playing of Williams and Russell uh, is better in some ways than that of Segovia. So I would say I don't uh, embrace the wholeheartedly um, you know, idealistic view of Segovia, but I also don't embrace the totally critical view of Segovia. You know, some people go so far the other way, they dismiss Segovia, and I think that either approach uh, may be a little bit flawed. He was a great man, probably in some ways maybe contributed more to the classical guitar than anybody else, uh, but was he the single greatest player? I would argue uh, maybe not uh, in some ways. And, you know, sort of coming into this equation is the fact that he wasn't always a really nice person and so that colors some people's view of him and I totally get that but uh, again I think his contribution can't be denied but um, some recent players may have done uh, maybe more as far as the technique and the ability on the instrument and, and just creating beautiful recordings uh, some some more recent players may have done even more uh, than Segovia. But uh, now I'll get some nasty comments maybe, but those are my thoughts. Another question, I look at the notes and it says six equals D. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means the sixth string is tuned down to D. So normally our sixth string is E, but in a piece that says six equals D, you're tuning that sixth string down to the D. And why do you need another D string? I mean, the fourth string is already D. Well, in that particular composition or arrangement, you need the low octave of the D. It just, you know, when playing a D chord, it provides more richness. You know, your normal D is here. And that's kind of a more trebly sound, you know, playing a D chord. But, but when you have the low D, it provides more richness and resonance to have that lower octave. So that's what that means. I'm gonna tune back to standard for the moment. Another question, what does C1, C3, C5, et cetera mean in sheet music? Well, if you see the letter C and then you see Roman numeral three or Roman numeral five or Roman numeral one, that means a bar on that fret. So C1 is bar on the first fret or C3 is bar on the third fret. C5 is bar on the fifth fret. Uh, why would C stand for bar? Wouldn't bar be a B? Well, some editions will use a B for bar, but C stands for cejilla, which is the Spanish word for bar. Uh, so that's why in editions that use the C for bar, uh, it's just referencing that Spanish word cejilla. Uh, good question. 
Another question is, I see an eight below the treble clef. I read that that means that the music would sound an octave lower. Uh, so I do I need to tune my guitar an octave lower or, or what do I need to do? Well, that's a good question. And actually in classical guitar music, uh, the music is normally notated so that the guitar sounds an octave lower than is written. So when we see what would be considered middle C on the staff, uh, so that's the ledger line uh, below the staff, we're actually playing a C that sounds an octave lower than that. So not all classical guitar music puts the eight under the treble clef, but all classical guitar music should have that eight. So the additions that have the eight under the treble clef, they're just being more precise about what already happens in all the other classical guitar music. So you as the player don't need to do anything different. Don't tune your guitar down an octave. Don't um, do anything different. It's just that editor, that publisher is being more precise uh, by including that eight. Uh, good question. When playing with thumb, what should be the angle of the shunk? thumb to the string? How should I attack the string? How should the thumbnail be shaped? Uh, good question. So when you're playing with your, your right hand thumb, your plucking hand thumb, I would first of all think about the position of my fingers because that's going to influence the position of my thumb. So I'm, I want my fingers to be at a good curvature where the index, middle, and ring fingertips are roughly even with one another. And I achieve that uh, by, again, the curvature of those fingers. So that's going to influence kind of the angle of the thumb a little bit. When I get my fingers in the curvature I want, generally my thumb is going to slope down a little bit. Um, you know, from the hand down to the string. And so it's going to have a little bit of an angled approach, but I'm going to want the nail bed of the thumbnail to be roughly parallel with the string. So in other words, I don't want the thumbnail at an angle to the string. That's going to create scraping. I want the thumbnail to be roughly parallel to the string. Uh, so I, I may have to sort of adjust the tip joint of my thumb to get that nail bed uh, parallel to the string, so I avoid scraping when I play with the thumb on the bass strings. And as far as the thumbnail goes, I actually like it a little bit lower on the side where the string initially contacts. Um, so, you know, I want it a little bit lower here, and uh, I find that allows me to use the flesh only of the thumb, which I like to do sometimes as a special effect. Uh, so I don't want the thumbnail too high on that side. I may have the thumbnail a little higher on the side where I don't pluck as much. Um, just because it allows me to kind of dig in and get more nail if I get the nail more over to that side. You know, but if I want less nail, then by having less nail on that side, I can do that. Or if I want to go entirely flush, I can. So good question about using the thumb and the angle thereof. Uh, another question is, uh, is playing by ear important for classical guitar? And yes, uh, playing by ear is important, maybe not so much for the actual performance on classical guitar because usually classical guitarists learn from sheet music. We don't usually learn by ear, but I think it's good to be able to play by ear because it trains your ear. And it's very important as a classical guitarist to be aware of the intervals you're playing, the chords you're playing, the scales you're playing, the keys you're in. And so I think playing by ear will help you to be more aware of the sounds you're creating. Uh, but again, we don't typically play by ear as classical guitarists so much, but a lot of popular guitarists, rock guitarists and things like that play by ear all the time. So I think it is useful for that as well. As classical guitarists, it's good to be versatile, to be able to play pop and rock and jazz and things like that. Uh, so playing by ear is useful for that reason as well. But I do think it actually helps our classical playing to have that ability and to have that sensitivity of the ear. Uh, so good question. Should I practice scales to cover the whole neck of the guitar? If so, how? Uh, so if you're trying to cover the whole neck of the guitar, I mean, one approach would be to use a Segovia scale. Uh, Segovia generally uh, wrote his scales to go from the lowest keynote to the highest keynote. So in the case of a standard classical, uh, we don't have a 20th fret. Some newer classicals add the 20th fret. But if you don't have a 20th fret, then your um, C scale is going to have the highest keynote at the um, the eighth fret here and so Segovia just does from here to here uh, for the C major scale. For a G major scale where we can go up to a G up here, he will start down here and do something like this. And so Segovia scale patterns are definitely good to get from the lowest to the highest keynote. Uh, but if you're trying to range more across the neck, you may want to 
use what's called CAGED scales. That's an acronym, C-A-G-E-D. Um, and basically they're based off of the chord shapes, C chord, A chord, G chord, E chord, and D chord, because you can move those scale shapes uh, or those chord shapes rather up the neck and each of those chord shapes has a corresponding scale with it so the c scale you've got c d e f g a b c uh, the a shape used here to play a c scale you'd have you know kind of this shape of scale with it um, and then after the a you have the g shape and then you have something like this you know that shape of the scale and then after the G, you have the E shape, which is the one we use on the bar most often. And here you have this shape of the scale. And then from there you have the D, which, you know, comes, you know, with that shape of scale. And so to be more versatile with your scales, uh, to branch outside of the Segovia or other familiar scale patterns, you can try kind of playing up and down through some of those caged uh, patterns like... Sorry. You know, that sort of thing would be a good way to use scales to cover the whole neck. So certainly I think scales like the Segovia ones are a good starting point, but you can also branch out with something like caged, which is used more in pop and rock, but also it's useful for classical players just to get a complete knowledge of the fingerboard. Uh, good question. And uh, should I say scale degree numbers while playing the scale? Well, you could do that. Scale degree numbers are like, you know, one is the first note of the scale, two is the second note. So if you were saying scale degree numbers while playing the scale, you'd do something like C, D, E, F, G. Instead of saying letter names, you could go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. And you could cut seven short so you don't have two syllables. Um, just say sev, but one, two, three, four, five, six, sev, one, two, three, four, five, six, sev, one, that sort of thing. And it is good to develop an awareness of scale degree. I find myself more often using the letter names, which I just subconsciously started to do a second ago, and that is to say C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Uh, that's more often what I do with scales, but um, the scale degrees could be useful to vocalize as well. Whatever you're vocalizing, whether scale degrees or letter names or solfege syllables would be another option. Um, that just kind of directs your awareness in a certain way. Um, the solfege syllables confusingly are used in two different ways. Sometimes solfege is used as if it's scale degrees. That's called movable do. Um, so, you know, for in C major, we go do, re, mi, fa, sol. We're in D major, we go do, re, mi, fa, sol. And we're just using the do as whatever the first scale degree is. Uh, but then solfege is also used as uh, what's called fixed do, which is where do is always C. So this would be do, re, mi, fa, sol, or this would be re, mi, fi, sol, la. Uh, or, you know, if you do non-chromatic solfege, it would just be re, mi, fa, sol, la. And so using the solfege could actually serve either purpose of either um, indicating the pitches in fixed do or indicating the scale degrees in movable do. And I may have thoroughly confused you with that. If I confused you, feel free to leave a uh, question in the comments and I'll be happy to respond further on that. Um, but that is uh, what happens there. But I would uh, personally, I say letter names uh, more often than I do the scale degrees or I use the fixed do solfege uh, more often when playing guitar than I do the movable do. But good question. How does humidity affect my guitar? Well, humidity does affect guitars because the wood of the guitar absorbs uh, moisture out of the surrounding air. Typically, high humidity is not a huge problem for a guitar. Um, you know, if you're in a, in a hugely humid environment, uh, it may affect the action, you know, as the wood uh, expands a little bit from the moisture, but uh, usually high humidity is not the thing you have to worry about the most. The problem is more low humidity. In the winter time, the guitar dries out, the wood shrinks, and sometimes the wood then cracks. And so you really want to avoid low humidity. It's sometimes good to have a humidity gauge or hygrometer in your guitar case so you're aware of the humidity and also to have some way to humidify the guitar. There's lots of these little devices that you can use to humidify your guitar uh, where you basically put it in, um, you know, maybe in the strings here, uh, a little device that has a sponge in it or something like that. And uh, I use one from uh, Planet Waves that's just this little plastic device you stick down through your strings. It has a sponge in it, so what you do is you go run water in the sponge in the sink, and then you stick it down uh, in the sound hole, and it keeps humidity in the guitar 
um, and that way it doesn't dry out. Um, a lot of guitars are made around 45% humidity, so if you have a humidity gauge, you can see where you are, and it's a good good place to start is just targeting 45% humidity, uh, maybe a little higher, but you just don't want the humidity to get too low so the guitar will dry out and crack. Uh, so good question. Another question, what is the action of the guitar? Well, the action of the guitar is the height of the strings above uh, the fingerboard. And generally, when we think about the action of the guitar, we think about um, usually about three millimeters um, above the fret at the first string, 12th fret, and four millimeters above the fret at the sixth string, 12th fret. So, and we'd measure that from the top of the fret to the bottom of the string. So again, about four millimeters on the sixth string, 12th fret, and about three millimeters on the first string, uh, 12th fret. And, you know, when we're thinking about action on the guitar, the higher the action is, the harder the guitar is to play, but the less likely it is to buzz. The lower the action, the easier it is to play. So a lot of players want the action as low as possible, but then sometimes you get buzzes. So I would say you want the guitar as low as possible without buzzes, and you probably need a luthier to help you set up that action correctly, but it is partly gonna depend on how hard you play. You know, if you... If you strum really hard and your action is low, then you may get some buzzes. Um, if you don't tend to play as hard, you tend to play lighter, you can have the action lower, make it easier on yourself to play. Uh, so it's a, a little bit of a compromise and a luthier can help with raising or lowering the nut in the saddle to get the action that's going to be as low as possible for playability, but still hopefully minimizing unwanted buzzes. So a good question there. Um, should you change your strings all at once? Uh, this is debated a lot. Uh, so in other words, should you take off all six strings and then put six new strings on? Well, um, a lot of guitarists have the concern, hey, if I take all six strings off at once, I'm releasing too much pressure. Maybe my neck is gonna you know, snap or snap off the guitar or something like that from the sudden release in pressure. Well. I might be a little concerned about that if you just take a pair of scissors and cut all six strings at once, that sudden release of pressure might not be good for the guitar. But if you gradually release the pressure, you know, by loosening the tuning pegs, um, luthiers tell me that taking all six strings off is not a problem. Luthiers do this all the time in guitar repair people, but just let the tension off gradually. Don't, you know, cut all the strings with a pair of scissors and have it release the tension all at once, and you should be fine to take all six off. Um, I often just take off one at a time because I find that maintains the constant tension on the neck and therefore it settles into the new tuning more quickly uh, in my experience. But occasionally I will take off all six and use uh, fingerboard oil on the fingerboard. Having all six off makes it easier uh, to oil the fingerboard, which is just good for the wood. So uh, certainly fine to take off all six sometimes, but uh, you may want to, you know, in kind of your everyday string changing, you might want to just change one at a time so that um, maybe it settles into the new tuning a little bit more quickly. But either way can really work. Another question is, what's the difference between a classical and flamenco guitar? A good question. So flamenco guitars typically have a cypress back and sides, whereas classical guitars more traditionally have rosewood back and sides. There are even some flamenco guitars these days made with rosewood, but uh, typically it's cypress for the flamenco, rosewood for the classical is kind of the stereotype. And uh, flamenco guitars tend to be just lighter in construction overall than classicals. They often will have a lower action for the flamenco. Um, and so they'll have kind of a, a lower sustain maybe than a classical will uh, because of that lower action. They're easier to play fast. Flamenco players really v value the speed and kind of percussive elements, whereas classical players are generally trying to avoid the buzz, so they do have that action just a little bit higher than the flamenco guitar. A very traditional flamenco guitar would have sort of friction pegs, which is what a violin has, where the peg's actually stuck in the wood and you change it. And I've played around with a flamenco guitar one time that a luthier friend made that had those friction pegs. Um, again, that's a traditional thing, but a lot of the modern flamenco guitars will go ahead and have tuners, even like a classical. Um, so you don't see as many of the friction peg flamencos, uh, flamenco guitars as you used to, but they're still out there. Uh, whereas you hardly ever see a classical guitar with the friction pegs, you'll usually see uh, the machine tuners on a classical guitar. So good question. Another question is, there's a crack in my guitar, what do I do? Well, if you have a crack in your guitar, I would probably take it to a luthier or experienced guitar repair person uh, to have that repaired. They're gonna have to 
probably put some glue into that crack and, and uh, secure it. But I would also think about how to prevent future cracks. And as we talked about a little bit ago, a lot of times cracks will have something to do with low humidity. You know, maybe the guitar got too cold, got dried out too much, and that's why the wood shrunk and cracked. And if that's the reason for the crack, which you may not know if that's the reason, but that's the most likely reason, I would say start having a humidifier in your case going forward. So once the luthier repairs it, hopefully you can avoid future cracks by keeping your guitar at 45% humidity or higher. Um, but yeah, I would, I would get a luthier to take a look at the guitar and they may be able to tell you there may be more structural issues with the guitar beyond just the low humidity. Um, maybe the guitar is reaching the end of its lifespan, unfortunately, but, but a good luthier or a guitar repair person can tell you more about that. Um, when playing with IM and A, is it okay to rest my t thumb on the fifth or sixth string? Yeah, absolutely. When you're playing with index, middle, and ring on the treble strings, I find that resting the thumb on the bass strings is a very good practice. Uh, it's a very useful thing. It just kind of provides stability for the right hand. So yeah, absolutely not a problem to rest the thumb on the basses while you play with the index, middle, and ring fingers, for sure. Uh, how do you keep the guitar from sliding on your leg? Well, um, I use this thing called shelf liner. You can just get this down at your local store. It's basically made for, you know, keep your cans of soup from sliding around on the kitchen shelf or whatever, and you just kind of lay it on the shelf. But you can get this, this product and you can cut it to whatever size you want. And so I just put this on my leg and keep it from sliding. Right now I have it on my right leg because I have a guitar support under my left leg. This guitar support, which is a neck up, actually uh, doesn't slide very much. It's kind of made of a suede type material. And so it really doesn't slide much to begin with. So a guitar support sometimes will have a non-slip element to it. But for me, sometimes the guitar will still slide against my right leg. So I like having the shelf liner on my right leg. Uh, when I'm playing with a footstool and I don't have the guitar support, I'll often have the shelf liner on my left leg and actually sometimes on both legs, just again to secure the guitar, make sure that it doesn't slide around. Uh, another question, is it okay to pluck at an angle to the treble strings? Uh, absolutely. I recommend this as the norm. So uh, the reason I recommend this as the norm is because I want to have my right wrist straight because having the right wrist straight uh, just allows the optimal function of the tendons. It helps you to avoid injury. You know, carpal tunnel syndrome and tendonitis and that sort of thing can be often avoided by keeping the wrist straight and aligned. So when I have my wrist straight and aligned, the way I position my guitar, that means I'm going to end up plucking at a little bit of an oblique angle to the treble string. Strings. That's totally fine. Um, the fingers will slide nicely through those treble strings, and it actually kind of creates a little bit of a warmth to the tone. You know, if you pluck completely perpendicular to the string on the trebles, you get a brighter tone. And so I actually like the warmer tone from plucking oblique. Um, so yeah, I, my norm with index middle ring on the trebles is to pluck obliquely. Now, if I bring index middle and ring down to the bases, I do pluck more per perpendicular to the string. I do allow a little bit of wrist bend at that point because I want to avoid scraping, which happens when you pluck obliquely on the basis. So I do bend the wrist a little bit there. I pluck more perpendicular. But when I bring my index middle ring back to the trebles, which is where they spend more of their time, I go back to my default straight wrist and I am plucking more oblique to the string at that point. Good question. How are partial bars notated? Well, a partial bar, a lot of times, uh, additions will just say half bar or they won't say anything. They'll just say, you know, C3 or B3 or whatever, you know, they'll indicate that you're barring on the third fret um, and maybe they don't say anything about whether you're barring all the strings or not. Some additions will just say, you know, a one half, one over a two, if you're a half bar, otherwise they just say the B3 or the C3 or whatever. Um, I personally like being more precise. So there are some additions that'll be like two out of six or four out of six or five out of six, indicating exactly how many of the strings you're barring. Um, some even get more precise if you're supposed to bar just the middle strings, you know, uh, strings five through three, and they'll indicate it's just, um, you know, strings five through three. So what I personally do is in my sheet music, if the addition is not specific about how many strings uh, you're barring, I will write in, and usually most of the time I'm, you know, barring to a certain string. So in this case, I might just say I'm barring to the fourth string or barring to the fifth string. So I'll write a four with a circle or a five with a circle or whatever, indicating how far my bar is going. Or I might say, you know, four out of six or five out of six or whatever. But I like to write into the sheet music 
how many strings I'm actually borrowing. I find that to be very helpful to avoid confusion. Now, another question I got is, uh, what about a hinge bar? A hinge bar is where you're either lifting the tip or the base of the bar, and this does happen sometimes. So, you know, maybe you're playing a bar chord and then you need, you know, an open string with it. Well, you might still need this G on the first string, but you're going to play the open sixth string. So in that case, you do a hinge bar. Or conversely, maybe you're playing this chord, but you need the E on the first string, you know, while you're still playing the G on the sixth string. So you could lift uh, the base of the bar, but still have the tip down. And that hinge bar technique is really helpful um, to be able to you know, get open strings while still keeping some notes uh, from the bar. And typically, again, an addition may not give you a lot of detail on this, so I'll usually jot a note to myself in pencil in my sheet music about you know, how many strings am I still barring if I'm hinging up off of the tip of the finger or hinging up off the base of the finger uh, when I bar. So thanks so much for tuning in today. Uh, each Monday around 1 p.m. Eastern time, I answer your questions on the classical guitar. So please let me know in the comments below what questions you'd like to see me address in a future week. And uh, keep making music. I'll see you in the next one.